So I really wanted an everyday driver frequency counter for the bench, um, and of course it had to be using Nixie tubes, well, because Nixies. Um, it turned out Heathkit's uh, IB1102 is really nice because it, it's one of their two last Nixie-based frequency counters uh, with full eight digits of resolution. And of the 1102 and 1103, this is the simpler of the two, which is nice because it makes it easier to debug if something goes wrong. Um, and it does exactly what you need without too much fuss. Uh, it only has two time-based settings um, for megahertz and kilohertz, and that's good enough. Uh, so it does what it needs to do. It resolves down to one hertz. It goes up to like 150 or 180. I, I gotta look uh, megahertz if I need it to. Uh, and overall, it's just a really nice, simple frequency counter. So that's why I chose it. Uh, I found this example on eBay. Uh, unfortunately, this one did not have the side bale handle, but that's okay because uh, it's going to be on a bench anyway. Uh, the only thing wrong with this uh, was that some parts were loose, which I reseated, and the indicator lights, there's a gate, kilohertz, megahertz light. The only one that actually worked was gate, so you'll see how I replaced that. Um, there was no power cord, you'll see what I did there, and of course it's power supply, a little DC power supply needed recapping. Uh, and so you'll see how simple Heathkit makes it to actually service this unit. So I'm not going to go into the detail of theory of operation or anything like that. Uh, others on YouTube have dealt with the IB1102 in far more detail than I want to here. Uh, in particular, I'll, I'll shout out uh, YouTuba and um, who does a, a really in-depth analysis of the whole thing, as well as Imsi guy. Uh, who does a who did a nice four-part uh, troubleshooting section on on the unit? So I'll refer you to them and just link in the description. Uh, so here I'm just going to quickly go over uh, and show you what I did to fix it. So when it comes to recapping the power supply section of the IB1103, um, the good news is power supply section is very very simple it's basically AC input a transformer um, and then the uh, power supply circuit board with its electrolytics and uh, bridge rectifiers all of the latter are on a very convenient um, board which plug in our module which is held by one little screw and nut here just tighten that and I'll tighten a little bit and then this whole board lifts out like so and so recapping this is going to be a actual pleasure so um, we'll put aside the unit for now and have a closer look and looking at the schematic as well as the board we have a couple of 2000s at these are not uh, these are going to be low voltage, like 15 volts or something. Although the Heathkit manual never really calls out voltage specs. But uh, these are the 8 volt un uh, unregulated output filter caps. Um, and then this, oops, there's a little nut that holds the board in place. There we go, put that aside, not to lose it. And then this is 100 at 70 volts. Uh, this is the unregulated plus or minus, I forget, 16, uh, running some logic. And then finally, those are the only three electrolytics in the in the whole unit, and so we'll replace those. Um, disk capacitors, noise capacitors is fine, transistors are fine. And then finally, there's this uh, 8 microfarad 200 volt. Um, this thing is actually perfectly fine. Uh, it has... It's, it measures out just fine, no instance of uh, stress or anything. If we actually measure the 8 microfarad uh, non-polarized cap here, uh, let it stabilize, give it a second, and we get about 8.6 microfarads. So that looks perfectly fine. And for our replacement electrolytics, uh, pretty simple. Here we have 
a 100, uh, where are you? The 100 at 100, so very nice. And then for the two 2000s, uh, we have a couple here. And these are going to be 2200 at 16 volts. And these will never see more than about uh, 8 or 9 or 10 volts, so that should be fine. So those will be our, our substitutes. And in order to get those caps off, uh, we'll start by just adding a little bit of fresh solder to refresh the connections, which are probably 60 years old now. Just add a little bit. And actually, kind of looked, those two kind of looked a little dodgy. No, but this will make it easier to extract the old solder. And then the cap is here. And then the other one is here. Uh, did I get that right? Yes, it's right there. All right. And I have seen others perform miracles with desoldering braid online. I am not one of those people. Um, so instead, my go-to tool has and continues to be this um, this makes extremely short work of deep soldering it is not the cheapest tool in the world but boy does it get the job done here and then here you can already see the cap moving around and this, this one. And with a little luck, they just come right out. At least, maybe this one needs a little more help. There we go. Those two, and then finally, uh, this guy here. something this runs extremely hot and out come our caps we'll probably test these I'm sure they're not horrible after all the thing did power up no flicker and everything but still why not and our holes are clear so ready for the installation but you can see some things have been running a little toasty uh, the rectifiers here, strangely, right here, have been running hot, but just slightly discolored. Um, but nothing too bad. This resistor is a little bit all toasty. I don't know what's toasty here, because, yeah, I guess it is the, the bridge rectifier here. But these diodes are perfectly fine. Yeah, let's put our desoldering tool away before we burn something. Switch it off. Great. So our new caps are in, facing the right way, polarity quadruple checked. Um, I also took care to clean uh, these little barrel contacts with some contact cleaner. And uh, this board is ready for reinstallation. Back at the chassis here, uh, nothing could be simpler. Oh, let's put the... Uh, Let's put the little screw and nut back into here. So that's going to go like this. Then the spacer. And then the nut. And that will straddle the chassis and hold it in place. Come on. All right. And so we... That's exactly what we didn't want to happen. I'm going to go fish the nut out. Try again. Come on. 
There we go. Now it started. And we'll start the nut. Please cooperate. And then we get to get the contacts down. Nope. Not quite. There we go. And then push that down and tighten this up. And that is not going anywhere. Excellent. When I got the IB1102 frequency counter, um, fortunately all eight of its Nixie tubes were working perfectly and all of the digits in those Nixie tubes were working perfectly. So that was very good. But the IB1102 also has four indicator lamps uh, around the, on its corners. Uh, there's a kilohertz one, there's a megahertz indicator lamp to show you which range you're in. There's a gate lamp which flashes when the gate is on to counting. And then there's an over range lamp which um, would only come on if you um, give it a frequency that's it's too high for it to count to. Uh, the only one of those indicators which was working, sort of, uh, was the gate lamp, which is actually possibly the most important one, because you can see at least the thing is counting, um, and uh, none of the others were working. Heathkit used incandescent grain of wheat bulbs for these. Uh, why? Because LEDs probably hadn't been invented yet, or at least uh, hadn't been commercially available at reasonable prices yet. Uh, when the IB1102 was released. So they used incandescent bulbs. And they said, so from the schematic, you can tell they only, they fed them five volts, and then the circuitry uh, brought that to ground through the bulb, and that would light it. Uh, so that was the extent of how it worked. So uh, three of these survived as I removed them. Uh, the other one was shattered. Uh, the, the one, the, the black one is burnt out. Uh, the one on the top left is missing one of its wires. The only one that survived again was the gate lamp, which to which I've connected my power supply here, so it actually works. Uh, for size comparison, if it isn't obvious that these are one, this is already resting on a one centimeter green grid. Uh, I know there seems to be a meme out there of um, using the most absurd coin one can find for a size comparison. Uh, so the only one I had handy that was uh, less observed, perhaps it was a one cent euro piece. So this is one one hundredth of a euro. Uh, you won't find these much in circulation because frankly they're, they're worth very, very slightly more than a US penny. But uh, that's my contribution to uh, absurd size comparisons. But why, why don't we just, if you like, we can put a, a, a link, here's a Lincoln US penny, uh, and here's the euro piece uh, for comparison. Anyway, uh, so the, it's the only grain of wheat bulb which still survives, it was the gate one, and I hooked it up to my uh, little Heathkit power supply, and I'm not going to go over, I'm going to turn it on, and you can see that it glows brightly. Um, pretty bright. This is 4 volts. I'm not going to go. This is 5 volts. I'm not going to go past 5 volts because that's all that it was sent uh, when it was running. And I'll actually not leave it there for very long. Uh, by the way, it's drawing about 50 at 5 volts. According to this, it's drawing something on the order of 50 milliamps. Um, so I'll turn it back down. Obviously, I've removed all four of these. These are the only three um, physically surviving. And what did I replace it with? I replaced it. I replaced all four with a three millimeter yellow LED, um, a three millimeter yellow LED, and a 330 ohm resistor for current limiting. This means that when it's on at five volts, the LED is drawing 10 milliamps, which is more than enough. Uh, and as you'll see, it looks it looks great. So. Uh, modern replacement for these uh, 
expired or expiring grain of wheat incandescence. Here's the uh, three millimeter yellow LED and its dropping resistor, um, which is behind the heat shrink here, uh, all ready to go. And it replaced the incandescent and the three millimeters fits very nicely into the original grommet that the incandescent fit into. There it is, and you see the other one, uh, that's the megahertz one, the kilohertz one, you can see below it. Um, and then over here, there's a new overflow one here, and then below it is the gate lamp, which has also been replaced, and all nicely wired in. So I wasn't willing to pay 40 bucks for an antique power cord, uh, which is what this thing took, which is actually known as a PH-163 connector. And I'll show you the power entry in a second. Um, these are also known as the HP Oval power cords. Um, and I'll put up a picture of what one of those cords looked like. So I thought I'd do something temporary uh, just as a as an AC line cord because it didn't come with any. So this is what I came up with. And basically it's holding on quite tightly to the pins. And all these are, pull them out, uh, these are just female uh, female Molex pins properly shrouded in color-coded heat sink, heat shrink, sorry. And then uh, a little legend here, white, green, black, to remind me uh, which goes where, uh, the hot, the neutral, and, and the ground. So anyway, that's what the original power entry uh, looks like for a PH-163. takes a so-called oval connector that's obsolete, and replacement cables uh, are quite expensive for no good reason. Um, could I have milled this out to take a standard uh, IEC 60320 or whatever it is, a power entry connector, the modern day instrument power connector? I suppose I could have, but I didn't want to massacre the back panel of, of, this, uh, of this frequency counter. So for now, until I come across an old cord at a flea market or something, uh, this, this will do just fine. I'll just be careful. So here we are, um, all buttoned up, showing 12 point something uh, megahertz in the megahertz range, as you can see on the top right. We switched to kilohertz, uh, and it's showing it down to the last hertz. Uh, the gate lamp is also flashing nicely. Uh, those are our LED replacements for the incandescent indicators. There's also an overflow, which you can't see in the top left, uh, which would only show up if I actually sent it um, too high a frequency. But that all works absolutely beautifully.